Good morning. morning. Grace and peace to you. Thank you, Jim, for those songs. Please keep all these folks uh, in your prayers. Uh, Know when these things are going on for quite a while, extensive, they can really wear on you, as many of you know. You've been through those kinds of things. And you get worn down physically, emotionally, and even spiritually. And you begin to doubt if God is even watching. So please pray for all these folks experiencing these these situations in in need uh, with illnesses and so forth. Uh, Shirley will testify that I had a struggle coming up with uh, this lesson. Not the lesson itself, but what to preach about. Uh, That's always one of the, the things you think about, pray about every week. What, what will we talk about this coming Sunday? And oftentimes it doesn't come easily. And I think I know why I was led finally to this lesson. And it has to do with the bulletin article that's already been written. And when you read it, and I encourage you to continue to read the bulletin articles, because I consider that as part of my teaching, you'll know what I'm talking about. So I think the Spirit led me to this lesson about our stuff. My stuff, the stuff. Do you have any stuff? Seriously, do you you have any? Uh, We accumulate it, don't we? Just in the natural course of living, uh, we receive gifts. We exchanged gifts yesterday. We inherit things from our parents and others of our relatives. And just in our own weaknesses, we uh, see things that, you know, I'll even uh, confess, I don't need, but I like it, so I buy it. Right? Anybody ever buy anything you didn't need? Uh Uh-huh. Come on now. I I saw a couple hands did not go up. (laughs) We live in a country where stuff is readily available and we have the means to buy it. Despite, you know, this supply chain crisis, there's still a lot of stuff out there to buy, isn't there? It's everywhere. And uh, I don't know if i got to find a level ground here. There we go. I don't know if we are, in the history of the world, the richest per capita people. If we're not, we're, we're, we're very close. That we have the most wealth of any nation that's ever been around, except maybe for some small one, maybe in like Monaco or some, someplace like that. We're, we're rich with this wealth this world's goods. How much stuff do you have? You have an attic? Basement? How much stuff's in there? How about the closets? Jam-packed in the corners and in the top of the closets? Garage? A shed? Did you put in a shed to put your stuff in? Uh, How many storage totes do you have sitting around with your stuff in? Maybe you had to rent a storage facility. You know, I don't know, when did they start with those? 20 years ago, they started popping up, a place you could rent to put your stuff. And they're very popular. They're all over the place now. Shirley, uh, when I was telling her about this this lesson, she... uh, informed me about the stuff cycle. Everybody know about the stuff cycle? You go to the yard sales and you buy somebody else's stuff. You bring it home, you put it with your stuff, 
and then you have your yard sale, and you sell your stuff, somebody else comes and buys it and takes it away. So there's this cycle. You go to the yard sale, you have a yard sale. You go to the yard sale, you have a garage sale. Okay. But having stuff, things, material possession, it's not a bad thing. God blesses us, doesn't he? He gives us the ability to prosper and to make gain. He does. It comes from his hand. But the question is, what happens when, when my stuff becomes the stuff of my life? That's the danger. And that's what we want to talk about today. From Luke 12, we want to look at a man who had a serious problem with his stuff. No, he didn't have a lot of uh, riding lawnmowers and bicycles, uh, workout equipment, bass boats or anything, but God prospered him. So Luke 12, starting in verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, meaning Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man... Who appointed me a judge or arbitrator over you? Now, deciding about people's personal problems like this was outside the domain of Jesus' work on the earth. So he avoids getting mixed up in this situation. I'm sure the man heard the wisdom that, God, uh, that Jesus spoke. You know, he could tell this was a wise man. And so this is why he calls out, you know, I, I need some help here to get, get this thing straightened out about my inheritance. But Jesus didn't want to get mixed up in that. I'm sure that Jesus could have worked it out, don't you think? If anybody on the earth, the Son of God, would have had the wisdom when he looked into it to get the whole thing worked out. But that wasn't why he was here. Can you imagine if he started doing this while he was on the earth? His whole mission and ministry would have been derailed. People would have been coming to him, you know, this man sold me a donkey and two days later it died. What, do I, what should we do? You know, I, I worked for two days for this man and he only paid me one day's wages. Make him pay me my wages, you know, whatever. He, he would have been inundated with all this stuff. And so he says, no, that's, that's not what I'm here for. And we can learn a lesson from this. Learn a lesson from Jesus. As a church and as individual Christians, we need to stay within the boundaries of what God has given us to do and not get involved in things out here that really have nothing to do with the kingdom or spreading of the gospel or helping people in need. We have to be very careful of that. And there's a lot of things you can do that are actually good, but they have nothing to do with the kingdom of God or bringing people to Christ. And so when we want to you know, make a decision and get involved in something, we really need to step back and ask, does this enhance the work of God? Does it glorify Christ in any way? So, you know, this lesson here is very important for us to learn from Jesus. All right, verse 15. Then he said to them, Jesus takes the opportunity here. We've said so many times this, these uh, on-the-spot lessons, in-life in lessons, we need to to be ready for that. And I always encourage parents, you know, when your kids come up with this problem or that problem, something pops up at school, man, don't brush it off. Take the opportunity right then to address it and to teach what the scripture says. So this is what Jesus does here. And he says, then he said to them, beware and be on your guard against every form of greed or covetousness. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions? Now, I'm not, I don't know that Jesus was necessarily accusing this man of being greedy. 
but it was an opportunity here because this man, you know, Jesus here is teaching in the crowd about spiritual things, and this man brings up about his inheritance or money. So Jesus just takes the opportunity and said, beware. God is concerned about how we use our money, our resources, our possession. That's plainly taught all through Scripture, and I'm not going to go to a lot of those places. But Jesus says, beware and be on your guard. We need to recognize that money, possessions, whatever, can get a hold of us, become an idol, and become our God and the driving force in our life. That's what Jesus is saying. He says, beware. He says, it can happen to you. Uh, I put down here, it can happen in a couple different ways. Suddenly, very boldly, you know, all of a sudden you're walking down the street and walk past a car dealership and there's that shiny new red Corvette. Boom. Oh, man, does that look good? And it just gets a hold of you. Yeah, I, I, I can, you know, here's one of the worst The worst sentiments mentioned in ads, and even we say it, I can afford that, right? You ever say that? I can afford that. That's the wrong question. The first question is, do I need it? Will it benefit me? Will it help out? Not can I buy it? Do I have enough money? So, you know, you can grab a hold of, you know, that walking through uh, wherever, the mall. Look at that diamond necklace. Wow, it's beautiful. Yeah, I, yeah, I'd like to have that. I'm not saying you shouldn't have a diamond necklace, but you know, how many do you have? How many do you need? God blesses us. You know, this is a, an area you have to, as Jesus says, beware. Is that the point to keep filling up jewelry boxes on your, on your dresser? What is life about? You know, top of the line golf clubs, bass boat, whatever. You can get a hold of you. And then it can become very subtle to get a hold of you. Just over time, you accumulate, and you accumulate, and you accumulate. And this brought to mind, we've all seen those shows about hoarders, right? Where, you know, the stuff they've got, I don't want it. Do you want it? Have you seen some of that? It's just pure junk. It's dirty, it's filthy, but what? It has become their security. That's what makes them feel safe. That's a form of covetousness that they've lost sight of what matters in life. They love their stuff because it makes them feel good, feel safe. And that happened over time. So Jesus warning here is a good warning, beware of covetousness or greed, of the possessions, because they can get a hold of you. The world tends to measure a person by their wealth, their stuff. You know, if somebody's got a lot of stuff, you know, you see even these shows on TV, the big house, the huge house. Yeah, man, I'd like to have that. That'd be great, you know, nine bathrooms and 14 bedrooms and, you know, whatever. But is that what life is about? Is that what we should be going for? Those kinds of things? Somebody that has that, we think they're, they're successful. Right? They got it made. They made it. They're, you know, they're on the top of the heap. But is that really true? You see, that's a world measurement. That's a worldly measurement. But that isn't God's measurement. And this is why we have to, again, beware. 
What is life about? Verse 16. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? So here we have a rich man to begin with. And again, no problem being rich, having money, having goods. God blesses us. We work hard. He blesses the work of our hands. That's fine. Maybe we inherit from our parents. That's fine. And that's the situation here. God blesses the good and the evil, doesn't he? We read that. He causes rain to fall on the just and on the unjust, okay? He blesses everyone in some way or another. Here's something to think about, and I've seen this, and you probably have too. I've seen some poor people who are very greedy. You ever see a poor person who is greedy? All they wanted was more and more and more. Give me more. They waste it, throw it away, but they just want more. So not all rich people are necessarily greedy, and not all poor people are not covetous. So again, it goes to the heart. So he asks a question. He says, how's that question go? What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? It's good to ask a question. Reasoning is good. It's God-given, but it can be faulty. He doesn't consult God. He only consults himself. What shall I do? I don't have any place to store my goods. If you'll notice, very subtle, but it's the wrong question to ask, isn't it? It's the wrong question to ask. What will I do with all my stuff? You know, here, it's, it's, he's been blessed in his uh, uh, fields, in his grain that he's harvested. That's his stuff right now. And he's got too much for his current barns. So he says, what will I do because I don't have enough place to store my stuff? What should his question have been? The question should have been, what should I do with my crops? See, there's a difference. He says, I don't have a place to store them. He should have asked, what will I do with them? Because that brings about some different answers, such as, well, you could give some to the poor, the widows, and the orphans, or you could sell it and give money to those in need, do good with it. And, you know, again, God was not consulted. Is he thinking he'll never be blessed again? Sometimes we think that, that God, God was, has blessed me now, and he was never going to bless me again, so I better keep what I got. And that's kind of what he's saying here. God would bless him again. God, God will bless. But he doesn't think that way. So verse 18. So here's his, here's his answer to his question, the wrong question. This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. You know, he's going he's to go down to the storage facility and rent one to put his stuff in. That would be what we'd be talking about today. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. See, his stuff had become his security. His stuff was going to provide for him for the rest of his life. 
We all make decisions based upon our view of life and values. And that was, that was his view of life. Things, resources, stuff is what provides your security. And that's how he made his decision. I'm going to keep it all for me. We make our decisions based on our view of life. We can't help but do that. We cannot make a decision based on something that we do not believe. We can't do that. We live and believe certain things. We have certain values as, each in, as individuals. And if our value system is messed up, we make wrong decisions, just like this man. This is why we encourage people, read the scriptures, see what life is about, put your faith and trust in God, seek to do, as Jesus said, seek the kingdom first and his righteousness, and he'll take care of you. All these things will be added to you. But if we're seeking things first, we're th seeking money first, career first, fun first, we're going to continue to make the wrong decisions in life. It'll mess us up, and it can ruin your life totally. And that's what this man did. So a lot of, a lot of good uh, truths here, thoughts. And I encourage you again, just read this little little story, this parable, this narrative over again. Not that many verses, but there's a lot here for us to learn about life. Continuing thoughts. He's going to tear down his barns. He's going to build new ones. The store his stuff that God gave him. He's going to store it for himself. So he's going to retire and kick back and just rest, let the rest of the world go by to live for himself. It's a completely selfish and godless decision. It's all about me. Ah, I take care of myself now. I got enough. He left God out. He left out other people. Sad thing. It's a sad situation when you look at it. But this is why Jesus says, beware of covetousness. When you start to love the stuff, think it's going to take care of you and be your security, we make bad decisions about life. Look what God thinks about him. Verse 20. God said to him, I don't know, you know, this is a parable, so I don't know how God spoke to this man. It's, again, this is a story that Jesus is telling. You fool! You fool. This very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? You know, we hope when we cross over that we can leave our stuff to someone who will appreciate it and, and do good with it. Right? That's one reason you make a will. You give it to somebody that will use your stuff wisely that you leave behind because, as they say, you can't take it with you. I don't know of a single person that's done that yet. Not one. They leave it behind. But he had traded his stuff for his soul. That's not a good trade. We take that soul into the judgment. And there God will say, okay, I gave you stuff. What'd you do with it? That's kind of what the judgment's going to be. I gave you a life. I gave you so many years. I gave you money. I gave you talents. I gave you resources. How'd you use it? That's the judgment. Were you a believer in my son? 
You know, if we are, if we truly are dedicated and devoted to Christ Jesus, we'll really listen to, G to uh, the words here that he tells in the parable. The life isn't about stuff. It's about souls. It's about doing good to help others. It's about the gospel. It's about those in need. It's about being like him. How much stuff did Jesus have? Think about that. You know, he told a man in one place, the one to follow him, says, I don't even have a place to lay my head, right? Pretty much the only stuff Jesus had was the clothes he wore. That was it. And once again, we're not saying, you know, we're blessed, we're given. We live in a place, and we have to have a place and, and a car today and all that. But what are you doing with it? Jesus' words are, need to be taken to heart. Beware of covetousness, because it can get a hold of you like that. It can be very subtle, and all of a sudden we're making poor decisions based upon you know, my future, my money, and this and that, and not thinking about our soul and the good we can do. So God is essentially telling this man, you're a fool, you've made a poor trade. You've traded your stuff for your soul. Verse 21. And Jesus sums it up. So is the man who stores treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. That's it, that's it in a nutshell. And what we've been trying to say and what the whole narrative says in the parable. If you're not rich toward God, you don't love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, following Jesus, seeking the things that are above, trying to do his will, rejoicing in your salvation, if that's not your goal and aim, that's not your treasure, you're probably making bad decisions of life and about life, and you're, you're going to lose it all. Whom do you value more, yourself and your stuff, or your Lord and your Savior? Psalm 101.3 there, I'm not going to turn to it, but I'm going to quote part of it. It says, I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. In other words, I will not focus on stuff that's worthless. It's a warning, same warning. And then 1 John 2, and we're familiar with this, but I wanted to close out with 1 John 2, 15. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. And this is in the context of love. Who are you going to love? What are you going to love? Don't love the world or the things of the world. There it is. The stuff. Yeah, it brings you pleasure. I, you know, I like. I used to go a lot, do a lot of fishing. I like, I like to have the nice rod and reel. Nothing wrong with that. But do I need 15 rods and reels? Is that what I do with my every evening that I can and all weekends? Just go fishing. Might bring me a lot of pleasure, but... Is that what I should be doing with my life, my stuff? If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. It's a divided heart. You can't serve God and mammon. Remember Jesus said? You can't serve two masters. That, that's the same thing John's saying here. For all that's in the world... The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world wants to get a hold of you, you know. Satan's behind it all, but however the world can get a hold of you, sell you something, even give you something that might get a hold of you. Beware. Here's the good, good thought. A warning, but a good thought. The world is passing away and also it's lust. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. There's the blessing.
beware. We all need to beware. To seek the things that are above, the good things. To seek to do good. And to trust God. To trust God that as he has blessed us, let us in turn bless others. And he'll continue to bless us with what we need so we can do his will and be, be his servants to show other people the way to Christ. God bless you.